Welcome. So, what do you think of our new digs? It is our third week in. And there are a few things left to figure out, but we've got coffee today, so this is good. Woohoo! But all in all, things are actually running quite smoothly, I think. I mean, we've still got a few things to, to figure out, but we're, going, we're getting there. So I've got a couple questions for you to ponder this morning as we do this. Sorry. As you look around this new place, how does it look to you? How does it feel? And what kind of potential do you see? <laughs> the facts are, we are closer to the junior high kids we once served in Lawton than we were over at Lawton, because they all moved out. Ivor Dent, the new K-9 school is right next door, right behind us which means we are closer to the elementary school kids as well, which is exciting. We are also right down the hall from Beverly Daycare, where many children and their parents from our neighborhood come every single day. And as tenants in this place, we have the honor, Nathan and I specifically, of helping to shape and mold this building into what it will, want come, what it will become. It's supposed to be a community hub in the end. So our ability to build relationships and share Jesus' love has changed from our time at Lawton. And the opportunities before us are very exciting. But our space here at Rundle is quite a bit different. Our physical foundation has shrunk. This gym is 20% smaller than the gym at Lawton, as I'm sure you guys have all experienced. We have less permanent space for Sunday school. Our storage space is quite a bit smaller, and we can't keep all the things that we once cherished. Even some of the toilets are smaller. <laughs> Let's just be honest, it's an elementary school. <laughs> How do you feel about that? I feel a little squished, maybe a bit mournful of all the space we had, maybe a little sad. If I'm honest, I have struggled with these feelings, and I've wrestled with God about them, and I don't think I'm alone. So today I'd like to share from my journey through this struggle, particularly about what God has shown me as I have sought his heart and what he has shown me through you, many of you, from prophetic words and prayers that you have shared and lifted us all up with. Because I believe God is rustling and quickening our spirits to remember his faithfulness and to renew our hope and our purpose and our strength and our minds so that we can continue in the work he has called us to all along here at Harvest. So there's a story about two guys in the Bible that I've been pondering and discovering these two guys. And I think it might help us look at our new home with some perspective, the story of these guys. Their names, and name your children after this if you'd like, their names were Zerubbabel, son of Shatil, and Joshua, which is pretty normal, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So we got the governor of Judah and the high priest. They lived about 500 years before Jesus walked this earth, during the reign of King Cyrus and then later King Darius. So in the book of Ezra, we read that Zerubbabel and Joshua, in an absolute miraculous set of circumstances, were commissioned by King Cyrus to start rebuilding the temple of the Lord. So at least 50 years before our two friends were even born, the first temple, the temple that King Solomon had built, was destroyed by the Babylonians. And that first temple was huge and beautiful. 
It was decorated with gold and precious metals, and it contained all these beautiful gems. And it also housed the Ark of the Covenant and God's presence. But King Cyrus, 70 years after that temple had been destroyed, owned that land. But he gave it. He gave this land to Zerubbabel and Joshua. All of it. And all the supplies needed to start working and rebuilding. And then he also told his own people to help them. And then personally, personally delivered all of the valuables that had been stolen out of that first temple that was stolen by the Babylonians. And there were 5,400 golden vessels alone that were given back. That doesn't include the silver and the bronze and the gems. Like there was thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of things that he gave to them. So this was no small miracle. God had made a way for his house to be rebuilt. So in Ezra chapter 3, it says that Zerubbabel and Joshua made a beginning together with the rest of the people. And they started working on the laying of the foundation for a new temple. They made a beginning together with the rest of their people. It's exciting, hey? Kind of feels like us. We're making a beginning together because we have to. Here we are. We are making a beginning together. And it's exciting. And later in the same chapter, we read that once the foundation was laid, they threw a huge party to celebrate. This is Ezra chapter 3. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. And all the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and the Levites and heads of the families, old people who had seen the first house on its foundations, wept with a loud voice when they saw this house, though many shouted aloud for joy. You see, the foundation of this new temple was smaller than Solomon's temple. And they must have been able to see this because they built it on the same land as the former temple. So there must have been some old stones still lying there, marking out the outline of the former temple, right? You see those, you see that in Greece and Athens and all these different places. So the old people, they saw this. And they would have been over 70 because the, the temple was destroyed 70 years before. And they wept. They lamented. They wailed. They remembered the temple of their youth and grieved the loss of what once was and would never be again. And this is okay. It was okay for those people to grieve what once was. And it is okay for us to grieve the loss of our old space. It is okay to remember the great times that we had at Lawton. It's actually important. It can lead us to comfort and wisdom and faith. But it can also cause the opposite, especially when remembering becomes about comparing. That can lead to disappointment and despair. We are called throughout the scriptures to remember. We are always called to remember God himself and his character. The everlasting covenant that he made with our ancestors and his faithfulness throughout all of our unfaithfulness. We're called to remember his unfailing love, a love that never, ever gave up on us time and time again. Story after story, we read again and again of God's patience, his love, and his kindness to his children. These are the things we are called to remember. 
You see, the word remember in the Hebrew language carries with it a forward momentum. We are to remember in a way that cultivates faith and moves us forward. The old people in Ezra chapter 3 were more into comparison and nostalgia. So nostalgia carries with it momentum as well. It moves us backward. It creates disappointment and even despair. Nostalgia can actually cause us to lie dormant and even lose faith as we live in the past and compare the future with what once was. The author Mark Buchanan in The Rest of God describes nostalgia as expectancy in reverse. I love that way, that, that way of looking at it. Expecting things to stay the same, disappointed when change comes, and never fully satisfied with any new outcome. Expectancy in reverse. So what's scary is in this story, the old people took the young people with them down the road of nostalgia. Because we read in the book of Haggai, which is where I'm going to settle in my story here, we read in the book of Haggai that 19 years after that foundation was laid, it looked the same. There was nothing but a foundation of rocks and probably a myriad of weeds growing over top. Nothing more had been done. So the question is, what were these people doing all that time? The Lord speaks to the prophet Haggai, and he shares this with our two guys, Zerubbabel and Joshua. He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say that the time has not yet come to rebuild this house, the Lord's house. And then the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai saying, Is it a time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? You see, the people had gone ahead and built nice, cozy homes to live in. They even spent time doing lovely carpentry and paneling their living rooms. And I hate paneling, but apparently that was beautiful back then. <laughs> After all, the timing to build God, the Lord's house, was off. Maybe because they figured he hadn't said much lately. So he must have wanted them to chill out for a while and furnish their houses. And trust me, there is nothing wrong with building a decent home to live in and furnishing it. It's okay. Unless you've been asked and previously agreed to do something else and haven't kept your word. In my experience, there are three different reactions, generally, of what people, how the people wait and transition. There are people who stand still, waiting for the Lord to speak while doing nothing. I had this vision of deer in a headlights. You know, just stop. People who step backward, or even turn around and run. They wait for the Lord to speak and become impatient. They lose hope. They lose their sense of pur purpose. And eventually they give up on God's promises and maybe even lose faith in him altogether. And then there are the people who continue to walk ahead. One foot in front of the other. They wait for the Lord to speak and while they're waiting... They continue to do the work of the kingdom that lies before them to do. Now, at first glance, it looks like the Israelites were standing still doing nothing. But looking closer, God points out that they were actually going backward and heading in reverse. In that season of transition, they were most likely plagued by disappointment. The temple hadn't turned out the way they had hoped. The foundation was small and unimpressive. 
they had lost the ability to envision what God had in store for them and to trust him with the details of it all. They had lost vision and hope and purpose. And this is the danger of nostalgia. If we let our thoughts linger for too long comparing what used to be and how great it was with how different things are now, we will run the risk of missing out on the future excitement that lies ahead of us. So with the Israelites, the Lord says, look at the state of your own house. He said, consider how you have fared. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And you that earn wages, earn wages to put them into a bag with holes. And in verse 9, he says, You've looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because my house lies in ruins while all of you hurry off to your own houses. God had spoken. He had told his people to rebuild his house. And they had chosen to ignore become complacent with his instructions, and they had reaped the consequences. It sounds like their houses were pretty nice, but they were hungry, thirsty, cold, and broke. The Lord had provided for their basic needs. They weren't starving, they weren't dying, but they weren't fully satisfied, and they were not flourishing. Consider how you have fared, he says, in neglecting the instruction of the Lord. I think the way we react to our current situation has a lot to do with the state of our hearts, just like it was for the Israelites. We will either choose to stand still, turn around and start walking away, or walk forward. Or if I could be more blunt... Sit on the fence or choose apathy and coldness of heart. Maybe maybe even turn and head in another direction away from the Lord altogether. Or we can choose to have faith and continue to walk that out in practical ways as we wait for the Lord to speak. There was a word shared in our prayer group that expresses this sort of forward motion. It was this, the Lord has called us to set sail with sealed orders. Or once upon a time, I watched The Hour of Power with Robert Schuller way back. And the only thing I ever really remember him saying was this one thing. I don't know who I'm going, I don't know where I'm going, but I know who I'm going with. And that has stuck with me all my life. I don't know where I'm going. Half the time I have no idea, but I know who I'm going with. Remember his character. Right? So building a temple, not that I've ever done it, probably wasn't easy. I think about it and there probably wasn't much of a quick reward going on or immediate gratification because it would have taken a lifetime to see a finished product, and only if you were lucky enough to live long enough to see it. So why was a temple such a big deal to God? What's interesting is that the temple wasn't even God's idea. It was King David's. He loved the Lord, and he wanted to love him by building him a temple. But the Lord speaks to David in 2 Samuel. He says, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? 
I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent in a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? The point is, God doesn't need a temple. He didn't need a temple to live in back then. The temple was for their sake, not his. They needed a place to gather, to honor, and to meet with him, and to remember and remind each other about God's steadfast love and faithfulness. If we continue reading in Haggai, we see what the Israelites chose to do about the Lord's words to build his house. It says, Then Zerubbabel, son of Shatil, and Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, saying, I am with you. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and, and uh, Joshua. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts. The Israelites were overwhelmed by the task at hand. But once they had decided to heed the instruction of the Lord and had chosen to commit themselves to the work the Lord empowered them, he let them choose. He always does that. He lays it out for us. Consider how you have fared like this and what I am offering you. Right? He let them choose. And then he gave them all they needed, even himself. The Lord promised to be with them. Now these words alone carried with them a great deal of comfort. The words, I will be with you. They were words that had been spoken to their ancestors and their ancestors had accomplished monumental tasks because God was with them. Here we see how the act of remembering becomes so vital in our journey. Because remembering the stories of God's faithfulness to his people cultivates faith. Now, God doesn't just say this stuff without backing it up. It says that he stirred up their spirits. This excitement, this choosing to walk and to do what the Lord had instructed them, the anticipation to work in the hearts of the people was not merely a bunch of hype and fleeting emotions. It was the Lord who stirred up their spirits to do the work. It was not something they did out of their own strength. Now I looked it up. The word stirred up in Hebrew would have drawn upon an imagery of waking someone from a sleepy or a drowsy state kind of rustling someone up, like, hey. The Lord woke up their spirits. He gave them strength, gave them courage, and sharpened their minds so that they could embrace the task that was laid before them. They had hope again and purpose and meaning for their work. I mean, the Lord had already given them the materials, all the materials and supplies to build the temple, 50 years, 19 years before, from King Cyrus. And now, because they had chosen to acknowledge their feelings of disappointment, they acknowledged that they were disappointed and repent for not working on the temple like they said they would. Because they had chosen to obey the word of the Lord, God stirred up their spirits, giving them vision to see the hope that was waiting before them. 
Now, I asked you to ponder a few questions earlier. As you look around, how does it look to you? How does it feel? And what kind of potential do you see? Because there is a task before us. We have been given a house to continue to build. Not a physical building with wood and nails, but a place for God's children, including us, to belong to his people. It died. Belong to his people, believe in Jesus, and become like him. Now, at first glance, it looks like our house has shrunk. But God's foundation is deep. Is it back? Great. And because God is with us, harvest has the potential to make a very big footprint. Yeah. Now, walking out this mission will and has stretched us. And it will be very uncomfortable at times, I'm sure. But God is in our midst. It was Jesus who was called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Isn't that just cool? He said this. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, there it is again, remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, over 10 years ago, maybe even 15 actually, a word came to harvest through a man of faith and at And this same word has been surfacing over and over in the past couple of years. I've heard it from different people from different places. It is out of Isaiah 54. Enlarge the sight of your tent. And let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes for you will spread out to the right and to the left and your descendants will possess the nations and will settle in the desolate town. Our foundation is smaller in the natural. But I believe we are being called to enlarge our tent, to stretch out our curtains Lengthen our cords and strengthen our stakes. I believe we are being called to reach outward, beyond ourselves and even deeper into our community than we've ever gone before. We're placed right in it, you guys. Enlarging this tent and making room for others by allowing God to expand our hearts. And I believe we are also simultaneously being called to strengthen our stake in Jesus. Strengthening that foundation. Holding fast to the one whom we serve. And never losing sight of him in the midst of the work that is set before us. Because before the move, we purged. We purged. (laughs) Katie and I specifically purged. (laughs) Everything we didn't need was purged from this house. If it, it either went to someone who could use it or to the dump. We also found things that we didn't know we had. Valuable things that can be utilized in this new space, which is kind of cool. Now, I believe God is calling us to clean and purify our hearts as well as recover gifts that have been forgotten about or have been let lie dormant. It is time to prepare our hearts 
for the harvest, for the work of the Lord is at hand. Do not hold back on receiving all that God has for you. And do not hold back on giving all that he has given you to share. For the time has come to build. It's come again. The time for harvest has come. That was a word in our prayer group that came last week. The time for harvest has come. And God is with us. Jesus is in our midst. The Holy Spirit is here to lead and to guide us. And he will stir up our spirits and wake us from any place we are slumbering and renew our minds. We do not have to do this alone. For he promises to provide all we need to build this house. And he has given us all the materials we, are, we need to build it in you and you and you and you and you. And he is with us to the very end of the age if we choose to say yes and obey his voice.